what do you think is the origin of life on Earth? And how can we talk about it in a productive way? The origin of life is like this boundary um, that the universe can only cross if a structure that emerges can reinforce its own existence, which is self-reproduction, autocatalysis, things people traditionally talk about. But it has to be able to maintain its own existence against this sort of randomness that happens in chemistry and this randomness that happens in the quantum world. And like, it's in some sense, the emergence of like a deterministic structure that says, you know, I'm going to exist and I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, pinning that down is really hard. We have ways of thinking about it in assembly theory that I think are pretty rigorous. And one of the things I'm really excited about is trying to actually quantify uh, in an assembly theoretic way when the origin of life happens. But the basic process I have in mind is like a system that has no causal contingency, no constraints of objects basically constraining the existence of other objects or forming or, or allowing the existence of other objects. Um, and so that sounds very abstract, but like you can just think of like a chemical reaction can't happen if there's not a catalyst, for example, or a baby can't be born if there wasn't a parent. Um, so there's a lot of causal contingency that's necessary for certain things to happen. So um, you think about this sort of unconstrained random system, there's nothing that reinforces the existence of other things. So so the sort of resources just get washed out in all of these different structures and none of them exist again. Um, or they just, you know, they're, they're not very complicated if they're in high abundance. And some random events allow some things to start reinforcing the existence of a small subset of objects. And if they can do that, um, you know, like just molecules basically recognizing each other and being able to catalyze certain reactions. Uh, there's this kind of uh, transition point that happens where unless you get a self-reinforcing structure, something that can maintain its own existence, it actually can't cross this boundary to make any objects in high abundance without having this sort of past history that it's carrying with us and maintaining the existence of that past history. And that boundary point where objects can't exist unless they have this selection and history in them is what we call the origin of life. And pretty much everything beyond that boundary um, is holding on for dear life to all of the causation and causal structure that's basically put it there. Um, and it's carving its way through this possibility space um, into generating more and more structure. And that's when you get the open-ended cascade of evolution. But that boundary point is really hard to cross. And then what happens when you cross that boundary point and the way objects come into existence is also like really fascinating dynamics because, you know, like as things become more complex, the assembly index increases. I can explain all these things. Sorry, you can tell me what you want to explain. Uh, I mean, explain or, or what people want will want to hear. Um, this... Uh, Sorry, I have like a very vivid visual in my brain and it's mm -hmm. really hard to articulate it. Got to convert it to language. I know. <laughs> it's so hard. It's not, it's like, it's going from like a feeling to a visual to language is so stifling I, sometimes. I have to convert it yeah. from language to, to a visual, yeah. to a feeling. Yeah. I think it's working. I hope so. I really like the self-reinforcing objects. I mean, it's just, it's yeah. just so I understand, one way to create a lot of the same kind of object is make them self-reinforcing. Yes. So self-reproduction has this property, right? Like if a system can make itself, then it can it can persist in time, right? Because all objects decay, they all have a finite lifetime. So if you're able to make a copy of yourself before you die, before the second law eats you or whatever people think happens, um, then that structure can persist in time. So that's a way to sort of emerge out of a random soup, out of yes. the randomness of soup. Right, but things that can copy themselves are very rare. Yeah, um, And so what ends up happening is that you get structures that enable the existence of other things. Mm -hmm. And then somehow, only for some sets of objects, you get closed structures that are self-reinforcing and allow that entire structure to persist. Right, so the one object A reinforces the existence of object B, but you know, object A can die. Yeah. So you have to like close that loop. Right, so this and is the classic idea. It's all very unlikely statistically, yeah. but you know, that's right. 
sufficiently um it's <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance there it's is a probability chance. and then but once you solve that once you close the loop you can create a lot of those objects and that's what we're trying to figure out is what are the causal constraints that close the loop so there is this idea that's been in the literature for a really long time that was originally proposed by Stuart Kaufman as really critical to the origin of life called the autocatalytic set so the autocatalytic set is exactly this property we have a makes b b makes c c makes a and you get a closed system but the problem with the theory of autocatalytic sets is incredibly brittle as a theory and it requires a lot of ad hoc assumptions like you have to assume function you have to say this thing makes b it's not an emergent property the association between a and b and so the way i think about it is much more general if you think about um these histories that make objects it's it's kind of like the structure of the histories becomes um collapses in such a way that these things are all in the same sort of causal structure and that causal structure actually loops back on itself to be able to generate some of the things that make the higher level structures. Lee has a beautiful example of this actually in molybdenum. It's like the first non-organic autocatalytic set. It's a self-reproducing molybdenum <laughs> ring, uh, mm. but it's like, like molybdenum and and basically, like, if you look at the molybdenum, it, it makes a huge molybdenum ring. I don't remember exactly how big it is. It might be like 150 molybdenum atoms or something. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the configuration space of that object, you know, it's exponentially large how many possible molecules. So, like, why does the entire system collapse on just making that one structure? Mm -hmm. If you start from, like, you know, molybdenum atoms that are maybe just, like, a couple of them stuck together. And so what they see in this system is there's a few intermediate stages. So there's, like, some random events where the chemistry comes together and makes these structures. Structures. And then once you get to this very large one, it becomes a template for the smaller ones. And then the whole system just reinforces its own production. How did Lee find this molybdenum? Uh, uh, <laughs> close uh, loop. <laughs> if I knew how Lee's brain work, I think I would understand so a lot this, more about the universe. But I <laughs> this is not an algorithmic discovery. It's a like, no, but um, but you, I think it goes to the deepest roots of like when he started thinking about origins of life. So I like I, I mean I don't know all his history, but like what he's told me is um, he started out in crystallography. Um, and, you know, there's some things that he would just, you know, like people would just take for granted about chemical structures um, that he was like deeply perplexed about. Like, just like, why are these like really intricate, really complex structures forming so easily under these conditions? And he was really interested in life, um, but he started in that field. So he's just carried with him these sort of deep insights from these systems that seem like they're totally not alive and just like these metallic chemistries um, into actually thinking about the deep principles of life. So I think he already uh, he already knew a lot about that chemistry and he also, um, you know, assembly theory came from him thinking about how these systems work. Uh, so he had some intuition about what was going on with this molybdenum that ring. The molybdenum might be able to be the thing that makes a ring. They knew about them for a long time, but they didn't know that the mechanism of why that particular structure form was autocatalytic feedback. Um, and so that's what they they figured out in this this paper. And I actually think that paper is revealing some of the mechanism of the origin life transition, because really what you see like the origin of life is basically like you should have a combinatorial explosion of the space of possible structures um, that are too large to exhaust. And yet you see it collapse on this, you know, really small space of possibilities that's mutually reinforcing itself to keep existing. That is the origin of life. There's some set of structures that result in this autocatalytic feedback. Yeah. And is it? What is it, a tiny, 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 tiny percent? I think it's a small space, but chemistry is very large. So, and so like, uh, there might be a lot of them out there, but we don't know. And one of them is the thing that probably started life on Earth. That's right. Or many, many starts. Yes. And it keeps starting, maybe. Yeah. I mean, there's also all kinds of other weird properties that happen around this kind of um, phase boundary. Um, so this other project that I have in my lab is focused on the origin of chirality, um, which is, uh, you know, thinking about, so so chirality is this property of molecules that they can come in mirror image forms. So like just like chiral literally means hand. So your, your left and right hand 
are what's called non-superimposable because if you try to lay one on the other, you can't actually lay them directly on top of each other. Um, and that's the property of being a mirror image. So there's this sort of perplexing property of the chemistry of life that no one's been able to really adequately explain that all of the amino acids in proteins are left-handed and all of the uh, bases in RNA and DNA are right-handed. And yet the chemistry of these these building block units, the amino acids and nucleobases is the same for left and right-handed. So you have to have like some kind of symmetry breaking where you go from these chemistries that seem entirely equivalent to only having uh, one chemistry take over as the dominant form. And for a long time, I had been really, I actually did my PhD on the origin of chirality. I was working on it as like a symmetry breaking problem in physics. This is how I got started in the origin of life. And then I left it for a long time because I thought it was like one of the most boring problems in the origin of life. But I've come back to it because I think there's something really deep going on here related to this like combinatorial explosion of the space of possibilities. Um but just to 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 get to that point, like this feature of this handedness has been the main focus. But people take for granted um, the existence of chiral molecules at all. That the, this property of of having a handedness, um, and they just assume that you know, like it's just a generic feature of chemistry. But if you actually look at molecules, if you look at chemical space, which is like the space of all possible molecules that people can generate. And you look at small molecules, things that have less than about 7 to 11 heavy atoms, so things that are not hydrogen, almost every single molecule in that space is achiral, like doesn't have a chiral center. So it would be like a spoon. A spoon doesn't have a, it, like it's the same as its mirror image. It's not like a hand that's different than its mirror image. But if you get to like this threshold uh, boundary, above that boundary, almost every single molecule is chiral. So you go from a universe where almost nothing has a mirror image form. There's no mirror image universe of possibilities to this one where every single structure has pretty much a mirror image version. And what we've been looking at in my lab is that it seems to be the case that the original life transition happens around the time when you start accumulating. You, you push your molecules to a large enough complexity that chir chiral molecules become very likely to form. And then there's a cascade of molecular recognition where, where chiral molecules can recognize each other. And then you get this sort of autocatalytic feedback and things self-reinforcing. So is chirality in itself an interesting feature or just an accident? Of no, it's a super interesting feature. I think chirality breaks symmetry in time, not space. So we think of it as a space, spatial property, uh, like a left and right hand. But if I choose the left hand, I'm basically choosing the future of that system for all time because I've basically made a choice between the ways that that molecule can now react with every other object in its chemical universe. Oh, I see. And so you've ac you're actually like when you have this splitting of making a molecule that now has another form it could have had uh, by the same exact atomic composition, but now it's just a mirror image isometry. You're basically splitting the universe of possibilities every time. Yeah, in two. In two, but molecules can have more than one chiral center, and that's not the only stereosymmetry that they can have. So this is one of the reasons that Taxol fills 1.5 universes of space. It's all of these spatial permutations that you do on these objects that actually makes the space so huge. So the point of this, this sort of chiral transition that I'm, I'm putting out is, is chirality is actually a signature of being in a complex chemical space. Um, and the fact that we we think it's a really generic feature of chemistry and it's really prevalent is because most of the chemistry we study on Earth is a product already of life. And it also has to do with this transition and assembly, this transition in possibility spaces, because I, th I think there's something really fundamental going on at this boundary um, that you don't really need to go that far into chemical space if you can to actually see life in terms of this depth in time, this depth in in symmetries of objects in terms of like chiral symmetries or this assembly structure. Um, but but getting past this boundary that's that's not very deep in that space requires life. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a really is a really weird property. And it's really weird that so many abrupt things happen in chemistry at that same scale. 